Welcome back to Spitball and Cards. In today's episode, we're going to be talking all about cards that we wish that existed that somehow do not exist. We want to talk about Topps Chrome, whether it's dead or not. Let's introduce who is here on today's episode. My name is Scott. I have a YouTube channel called Scotty B Cards. We have Phil with a YouTube channel called Filmington. You can see it on his shirt right there, represent Phil. Then we have Ty, who is also known as Teapot on Instagram, but he also has a channel with Sports Card Investor. He runs the Market Movers channel. And we have Chris, who doesn't look like Chris today because he's not wearing a Braves jersey. I don't know what's going on there, but he also has a channel called Blabbing About Slabbing with our good friend Jeff, who is not able to make it. All right, the very first topic I want to discuss is going to be about cards that we wish that existed that do not. We have a lot of cards in the history of baseball cards that should exist that just were never created or never produced for whatever reason. A good example of this that I'm going to share, it's on the thumbnail of this video, so it's not spoiling anything, is the 2011 Bowman Chrome Mike Trout autograph. Mike Trout, if you want a quick Mike Trout history, he has two rookie autographs, the finest and the sterling. The finest is the only on card, but there was a production sheet that was recently sold. Mike Trout actually signed it of his Bowman Chrome autograph card. And you can see what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And so that card doesn't exist, but it almost did. And there's plenty of examples like that. So I want to go around the group and discuss which cards we wish that existed that just don't for whatever reason. So I want to start with Chris. What card do you wish existed that just doesn't exist? Uh, first off, I just want to say to everyone out there, I'm sorry I'm not Jeff. You know, this is a broken record for me. I feel like when I show up at parties, I always have to say that. Um, Wow, that, that Mike Trout, I just want to say, is that the worst like last minute decision that Tops has ever made in a set? Like, yes. When you look at the other autos that are on that checklist, like, man, you know, they, they printed Trout and they were like, mm, nah, forget it. And they went with someone else. And well, that stinks. All right. So I have a, I have a few that I want to talk about. But one of the biggest um, that I really, really wish existed is the 1952 Tops Ted Williams. Like, that's probably the most iconic top set of all time. He's probably the best hitter of all time. And for a litany of reasons, like no contract with Tops and some military service, like he's not in that set with Mantle and Mays and uh, Eddie Matthews and Jackie Robinson. And it would just be really cool to see Ted Williams in that set. I wouldn't be able to afford the card, but I would love to see it. Actually, on that same note, I don't believe Stan Musial has a card in 52 Tops either. And right. that's one that I wish existed. He was in Bowman and 52. It's a great card between all of us here and everybody who's listening. I actually prefer the 51 and 52 Bowman set over 52 tops. I don't know if that's sacrilegious or not. I think the art's better. I know it's not the same size as a traditional baseball card. Technically, neither is the 52. It's slightly bigger. Um, but either way, 52 kind of set the precedent of what we have today. But I've always loved the art of the 51 and 52 Bowman set. Okay, Phil, what card do you wish existed that doesn't? Growing up as a Red Sox fan, I, uh, I was a big fan of David Ortiz, and Pedro Mandy Ramirez as well. And I think um, with David Ortiz, his popular flagship base rookie coming out of Fleer and Ultra, but not really any other product like a Topps um, or even at the time a Donruss, I think that is something that might have hurted his collectability. It would have been nice to have more options for David Ortiz. Um, Pedro Martinez, I think from 91, he's got like an upper deck minor league edition card or something, but that's a little bit weird. And there's probably a lot of other reasons why these cards aren't coveted um, because those guys peaked a little bit later after the card boom and Pedro Martinez being a pitcher and all. Um, just a, a more general comment. Uh, I was talking to those back pages a little bit before the uh, we started recording, and he is a big advocate on etching. So etching is like a more advanced printing process that they used a lot in the 90s and early 2000s. And it's a way to make the appearance of like a multi-layered texture although it's not textured um like a multi-layered appearance in a card and you can see this probably starting if you go back maybe like 16 years ago in like 2007 2006 according to him that's the last time he's seen it hmm. um and it's something that can be confused with borders on a card so he was trying to show me what he meant by it and i guess it's probably not scalable for fanatics to do this again so it might not ever be coming back but that's one of the things that'll separate the, the inserts from the 90s, the rare runs, uh, from anything that Fanatics will be capable of moving forward. I love it. Okay, so Ty, I want to hear yours. I want to share a few of mine as well, but what cards do you wish existed? I feel like I'm coming at this a little bit um, from a different perspective, just in that I got into baseball, you know, collecting a few years ago. And it's, I think of all the sports, it's one of the trickier ones to always understand, like, 
which product a rookie is in because in the other sports they they tend to be in all of them unless they were like an obscure player so when you're like was he in series two was he an update and we talk about the number of rookies for soto versus acuna versus otani and there's a lot of like angles you could go down that path right and say like oh i wish this guy had been in this set but he wasn't kind of like you did with the trout card um i went a little bit different direction with this mentally and uh as i'm lamenting how bad the tigers have been and they haven't had any success I'm I'm wishing there was a card that existed of the Tigers in some playoff capacity or a World Series, like what they do in Stadium Club and other products where they'll have like the the specific championship, you know, players of of certain key players, because they blew up that pitching roster that was so crazy back in 2012 when they had Scherzer, Verlander, Doug Fister, Anibal Sanchez, uh, Drew Smiley, and Rick Porcello, all of whom went on to win World Series with other teams in the subsequent like six years. Uh, I think the last one was probably Fister and Scherzer when they won with the nationals. So I just, I find myself always thinking back about that and going, why did they do that? There's a great documentary, uh, a little, or a little video out there about like kind of the demise of the tigers. I'm forgetting the name, maybe it's secret base or one of those, you know, channels. It's so good. Um, so I think about that. And then I just in general would like to see more, um, somehow when fanatics takes over more multi-sport crossover cards like inserted maybe into a baseball product but if you had like a hometown heroes type concept with you know Cade cunningham and uh you know it's um i don't know torkelson or somebody right like sh sharing that type of stuff i've had a few custom cards done like that that i think are really cool so once tops has all that licensing uh that might be something interesting that they could do and then just to go outside the box one thing that just is kind of a crying shame I'm not a LeBron James fan, but the fact that he's exclusive auto to upper deck and hasn't been able to sign over the years uh, in other products like Panini is just kind of crazy. And the same thing goes for Michael Jordan. So we can't get those autos in, in ultra modern products because both of those guys have been exclusive to upper deck. So that's just uh, sort of like, I kind of wish it existed, even though I don't, um, I probably couldn't afford either and wouldn't go after a LeBron. There's a few modern baseball players of the same, thing right they've they had fanatics exclusive contracts before fanatics owned tops i'm interested to see what happens to those players moving forward but either way like don't you think in some way though it's kind of cool that jordan and lebron are so rare you know at the, on the flip side of that coin because if you really want one it's more of a rare card from a rare year or do you think that is blown out of proportion by I, I i don't like to see autos overdone um i just i think it would be really cool to have just Jordan in general in ultra modern products. It would like blow things up. I can't imagine what wax prices would do if Jordan were actually in ultra modern products like they do with, they overdo with Kobe every year and some of the other um, older athletes. So I don't know. I wish they were in there personally. Cause we see Tim Duncan, I believe just re-signed a contract to rejoin Panini. So, which is cool. That's awesome. I know some Tim Duncan collectors were excited about that. So here's a few of my picks. I know Chris had a few more, but a few of my picks, mine aren't as, romantic i don't know if that's the right word as yours mine are just more i wish max scherzer i wish zach Greinke, i wish jose ramirez and i wish joey Votto had traditional bowman chrome autographs like just straight up i would love to somehow own a zach Greinke gold bowman chrome autograph and we can see that Greinke in general hardly has any rookie cards he basically only has one or two and his rookie autograph is from an upper deck set and it's uh, it was signed on like a postcard. That's not right. We're like a piece of paper, and then they inserted it into a card. So it's not a sticker, and it's not on card. It was like inserted to the card. And half of the time, you can't see half of the autograph because he signed slightly too big for the window of the card. So I wish he had a Bowman Chrome autograph in particular. I think it's kind of endearing that Jose Ramirez doesn't have a Bowman Chrome autograph because he has a Topps Chrome autograph, and that card becomes it's, it takes that place. So I kind of like that. I wish in more cases players had less cards. I know it's counterintuitive to what we're talking about, but those are just a few of the ones that I personally had. So Chris, which other cards were, do you wish existed? Okay. So I have one that I, I have wished existed since uh, 1988 um, when the, uh, the hobby was really starting to explode. There was one big name late in 1988 that everyone was talking about and into 1989. I'm not talking about Griffey. I'm of course talking about Greg Jeffries. Greg Jeffries was the only card people wanted in 1988. So he is in Donruss, he is in Fleer, and he is in Score. But he does not have a Topps traded rookie mm. card. 
And this, I remember just being utterly baffled by this, like back in the time. And I remember like my card shop, uh, they didn't have any sets, but they did not. They were also just, they couldn't figure out why Jeffries wasn't in there. It got so, I was in, this is, well, it doesn't matter. I was in like fourth or fifth grade, fifth grade, I think. And we had a baseball card club. I, I can tell stories about that some other time. They're not, uh, it's not bragging. It's like the opposite of bragging. But we actually, we each designed, like I remember drawing like a 1988 Tops design and how we would want Greg Jeffries to look in the card. I wish I could dig that up somewhere. I'm, I bet my mom has it like in a box and in a, in, a, in a closet, but so far I haven't found it. But that is a card I didn't understand then why it didn't exist. I mean, now that thing could be worth north of like 15 cents. But back in the day, like that would have, that would have been right up there with like the 86 update, like Canseco in terms of hype and excitement. But sadly, we never got it. I wish Mike Trout had a Topps Chrome rookie card with Topps yeah. Chrome parallels because he doesn't have anything. Even if it was like the more short printed Topps Chrome update like we see in 2014 and 2013 and 2015, 16 and so forth. Uh, that changed, I believe, in 2018. But it'd be great to see what those chromium refractors would have gone for. They had to have gone for a ton because he didn't have very many in the first place. Yeah, It would also be cool if his 2012 Topps Chrome was just him. It wasn't like him. I think yeah. he's like Tory Hunter and maybe Trumbo is behind him. Like yeah. mm -hmm. if it was just him, that card would be way more popular than it is now. That's why his Topps Chrome from 13 goes for a lot just by himself. Yeah. You can only imagine what it would have been. Phil, you had something you wanted to say. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say a lot of people point to the uh, 2011 update Trout card as being like what set off flagship yep. rookies base rookies in PSA 10 in like 2020 2021 so it would be interesting like yeah like you said Scott if there was a Topps Chrome rookie card what what would that have done um eventually Topps Chrome got its love shortly after flagship did um regardless of you know the trout situation so was like how important was that a, 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 as a factor for that flagship boom I guess we'll never know I feel like it's pretty high, Phil. Like, honestly, I bet it's pretty high because if you look at that, same with Altuve and Goldschmidt, they also didn't even have one. And so I wish both of those players had Topps Chrome cards and Topps Chrome autographs. Neither of them have Topps Chrome autographs. How many, let's ask, how many rookie autographs does Paul Goldschmidt have? Do you guys know? Uh, no. Zero. He has zero rookie autograph sets. His only autographs are from Bowman Chrome. Uh, so... Wow. That's why, like, I love Paul Goldschmidt, but it's one of those things where they were for 2011, which is kind of a weird year where no one really collected as much as they do now. Uh, and for that purpose, that's hurt. So, Ty, did you have one more you wanted to share? Yeah, I wish 2023 Top Stadium Club existed. <laughs> and I know Chris will second that. Uh, I wish that product were out. I hope it actually comes out. We heard that freaky rumor that they accidentally double printed the front on both sides or something. I don't know if that's true or if there's any credence to that, but I really hope that product is releasing. Um, and then I, I did a video recently on the market movers channel about some of my favorite things in the hobby, maybe more than others. Uh, one set that I'm a big uh, fan of like a specific year is 2021 Bowman inception. Just aesthetically, I really like it. Um, but it, it doesn't have, it's like the hundred prospects. So it's like one of those tweener sets that doesn't have, rookies in it and it doesn't really have like veterans so i kind of wish that product had um a, an expanded checklist or something available for it just so i could pick up more like key active veterans rather than kind of just going after i just got a um josh young which is pretty cool it's like a gold it was like eight bucks but um that's just a set i think looks really nice and the checklist is kind of weird for it I also wish Juan Soto had on-card autographs from 2018 Topps Chrome or Topps Chrome Update because that's unfortunate. They're all stickers. His best rookie autograph for stickers. It is. It is. So I got one more. 2019, uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. makes the Padres opening day roster. Everyone got really excited. They weren't going to manipulate his service time. Topps knew he was going to be like one of the most like desired pulls the entire season. And for some reason, they did not make him a single image variation in any flagship mm -hmm. products. Really? And I have absolutely no idea why. Why we didn't get like an update SP or SSP off of his rookie debut card. I'll just, I'll never understand it. Like I just, that, that exclusion baffles me to no end. Because Guerrero got him and he debuted like four weeks after Tatis did. So so did know. Series 2 not have any image variations? Was that part of the problem? Uh, I think it did. I think they just had, I want to say they just had SSPs. 
But I mean, really? they could have just done it off of his rookie debut because I know in like 2020, like Bichette and Alvarez have variations off their rookie debut cards. I don't think it would have stopped people from wanting them. But yeah, I, I've for some reason I thought that Series One had short prints and SSPs, perhaps. And I know they messed up, but like Jumbo didn't get like short prints or something. Regular Hobby did, and then I know an update they did. I just don't know if, it's, if in Series Two there was much for like an Alonzo or Eloy. I feel like they wouldn't have had anything either, but so yeah, Phil, I looked it up real quick. Oops. So I looked it up real quick. You can see rookies like Nick Martini, Yusei Kikuchi, on, on who else? Miles Draw had image variations, but not the right. good rookies. Then there were yeah, super yeah. short prints, primarily of vets, and the only rookie was Kikuchi for the super short prints. Makes no sense. You're absolutely right there. It's yeah, it's because of like when they start printing the product, probably. Like this is a product that comes out in June. It's hard enough. Yeah. To, it was hard enough to get those guys into Topps Chrome, which comes out two months later, six weeks later ish. And those guys came in. Remember, their cards were short. The base cards yeah. of like That's Vlad, right. Tatis, Alonzo, because they were rushed to to put those guys in. So, I guess there was some ability to get their base card in, but maybe they weren't able to get like additional I don't know, shots. Yeah. yeah it's it's that's why the Vlad, it wasn't quite a short print, you know, yeah. there's thousands of them, but it was still more short printed than the base because they wanted to insert it, but it just wasn't as easy. Yeah. But then, yeah, then they gave Guerrero an SP where he's pointing and that SSP, which is one, I think Guerrero's coolest card where he's holding up his uh, first hit. Yeah. And that card's like impossible to find. Like, I just, I mean, they, they could have, they could have done Tatis and update and those two cards would have sent that wax, probably would have doubled it, you know, for wax holders. If, if of course Tatis hadn't, you know been suspended i i really hope that guerrero can put it all together at least one more time for us because he's only had two seasons above 800 ops in five years which is nuts so but I'm not trying to throw strays at vlad but let's talk about <laughs> someone i wish had less cards and that's otani why in the world did tops give him two bowman Chrome autographs two heritage real one autographs two flagship yeah, images they had, Series one, sorry, series two and update. And they're both pitching. They could have done like a hitting and a pitching. That would have made more sense. None of Otani makes sense. And so that's one I wish we could go back in time. We're talking about like world record sales. If there was just one super fractor yeah. Otani, if there was just one out of five Otani Bowman chromatograph, that's the type of card that I wish they didn't screw up. Even Topps Chrome and Topps Chrome Update each have autographs, which is unfortunate. Yeah, he's got five image variations. In yeah, 2018 flagship. Five. <laughs> you got three SSPs. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. And at, yeah, at I'll least walk... go ahead. At, at least with the Bowman Chrome Auto situation, there's no Bowman Chrome First Auto, obviously. Um, there's a Bowman Chrome First in Mega Box the year prior, but yeah, you know, that that counts. That still sells decently. Um, but at least he doesn't have a situation like with Tatis and Wander. They've got their first Bowman Chrome Auto, then they've got their rookie auto in Bowman as well. And we've talked about this before, but. The uh, the base version pitching pose was short printed. The hitting pose out of Bowman Chrome was a uh, redemption, which is now expired. And that's really limiting pops on those cards. And if you look at the pitching pose, he doesn't have like, and Chris, you probably know this more than me, but he doesn't have all of like the shimmers. Like I feel like he doesn't have like a green shimmer. He's missing some of the waves. Or is that the non, no, he doesn't have non autographs in that one because it's just, just paper. paper. Yeah, just the paper, paper pitching. Yeah. So I, I don't mind the Bowman Chrome situation because if you look at their PSA 10 base auto, like from pitching and hitting pose, it's only like a hundred combined PSA 10 pop, which is way less than what you'd get from like a standard Bowman Chrome first auto prospect base PSA 10 from guys from like 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, et cetera. And I feel like we could go on all day about like 90s, early 2000s players who wish had more of the, you know, the black heritage refractor rookies or the top chrome gold rookies. But like even Pujols, he had a technically a gold refractor, but it was like the foil because he was a late insert insert into regular top chrome, I believe, before being in top chrome traded as a regular retrofractor. But I wish Vlad had a not Vlad, sorry. Albert Pujols. Did I say Vlad the whole time? I meant Pujols. I wish Albert Pujols, he had a number to 50 refractor from his rookie year. I would love to see what that card would go for. We see the gold Bowman Chrome Ichiro go for about 10 grand. That's out of 50. But Albert Pujols doesn't have a base Bowman Chrome card either. So there's a whole bunch where just kind of missed the mark. But any final thoughts before we jump to the next topic? 
Yeah, having thought about this, oh. this, this card, I just want to say, I think the number one thing, the number one card I now wish existed is I wish the US one Otani was the, the image from his rookie debut card. If that was just a hitting image, I feel yes. like that card would be through the roof. Like the parallels would be incredible. But as they are. It, I mean, it makes it so like long term, the preferable base card is going to be without a question, the Bowman Chrome rookie yeah. hitting pose just because of that situation. So mm -hmm. you, you take a little bit from one side and then it makes that card more desirable. And it's not nearly as printed as much as Series 2 or Update. Totally agree. There's one other card that I wish existed, and it was a producer Lance, first Bowman Chrome. Sup, okay. Lance? Lance is here off stage. Hello. Welcome Thanks back. for having me. All right. See you, Lance. <laughs> Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, Lance. <laughs> All right. Next topic. Ty, what were you wanting to reference? I think you want to talk about the ComC eBay situation just really quickly. Yep. I just had a quick a few thoughts on that. So the news came out that uh, eBay and ComC have entered into some kind of a formal partnership with each other. There's still not a ton of details, but when the the um, PR statement or release came out, there was a first line and it said, deal will expand ComC's technology-based listing and management model, offering collectors extensive selection and improved listing capabilities. Now, I had to reread that a few times before I realized they were talking about basically ComC benefiting from this partnership. Uh, Simon 466 Cards is a YouTube channel and Instagram account, and uh, he made a video kind of asking some questions around like, does this mean, is this because eBay's vault is not doing great or could be, you know, uh, underperforming or something. They're trying to like get more into vaulting with ComC. There were a lot of rumors for the last two years that ComC was going to get bought by fanatics. Uh, so I don't know what this does for that. Or um, I guess maybe that's off the table. Now people were really speculating around that piece. The, the part that I'm really hoping we see, and I hope, somebody at eBay is, is watching. They've been trying to make changes um, to their listing process on eBay and they are requiring more metadata attributes and all of that stuff needs to be accurate. And they're trying to avoid search manipulation. ComC absolutely smokes every other listing platform when it comes to how you can list a card on there. Why? Because they actually have all of the complete checklists for all these products in their database. And if they don't, when they get a card, that's a real card that they'll, they'll list, they add in that checklist. That's part of the reason why sometimes it'll take a card longer to get added is for something obscure. So they'll add all of that de detail in, and that empowers the, the buyer to go in and say, okay, I want to see every for sale item for this card, right? So I can see all the listings, same card. There's no funny business. There's no I got to tweak my query just so to make sure I get the proper listing titles. And right now that aspect is actually broken on eBay, partially broken, because if you search for a player in your search, even if his name's not in the title, if it's the player selected on the listing, it'll still show up. So that's been screwing up my safe searches. So my, my hope is this is something long overdue. I've talked to a lot of people about it over the years. I've tried to talk to eBay about it, um, is that they will move down that path of setting up all that card structure data for their database so that users can go on. All you have to do is start typing Fernando Tatis Jr. 2019, and you're gonna get a drop down of his cards available and you instantly list. It'll have all the data accurate, all of that type of stuff. That would be a much better shopping experience. That would be a much better buy, um, selling experience for everybody. And that's the piece that I'm hoping through this. I haven't heard anybody else talking about it, but that's the thing that ComC does really well. And I'm hoping that's a fruit that comes out of this that eBay can get out of it. Um, and was one of the reasons I thought maybe when I heard this announcement that they seem to be struggling so much with some of this data requirement that they just went down that path and said, let's pay ComC. They've already done all the work and uh, try to leverage that for our technology. So some some thoughts around that, some wishful thinking, maybe we'll see what comes of it. I love ComC, by the way. I never used them until like six eight months ago and they're the best so you haven't ever used them to really collect a low end that's not a nice statement but like a low end player price wise they're excellent but yeah thanks for sharing that ty so the next topic i want to discuss is going to be 2023 tops chrome and in particular tops chrome is a brand recently i made a video where i was analyzing the number of parallels that we've seen increase year over year over year since the introduction of Topps Chrome back in 1996, as well how hard and expensive it is to hit certain parallels like the gold refractor and certain autographs of specific players. 
So a little bit of history, just super fast. Topps Chrome was introduced in 1996. It had one parallel. It was the refractor. And then I believe in 2003, Topps Chrome, we had the black refractor introduced. That was number two. I want to say 50. And regular Topps Chrome and Topps Chrome traded was out of 100. And then basically in 2004 through 2006, we got Topps Chrome how we know it today with more of a rainbow of colors. There was like four or five parallels at max. And we had rookie autographs in the typical format that we know now. But in 2005, 2006, you had 13 autograph subjects in each set. So if you wanted to pull a specific player's base autograph card, assuming every autograph is a base autograph card, it's one in 13 boxes. Now we have 130 autographs. It's actually 129 in Topps Chrome. And you get one autograph in hobby boxes now. Actually, I take that back because I believe you got two autographs back in the day in a hobby box. So it was even like one in eight or no, to get the player you wanted. But now it's one in 130 to get the autograph you would like. They're just pumping it full of random relievers pitched one inning on a call up and then they never made it back to the big leagues. And on top of that, they've int actually introduced more parallels than ever. There's 27 parallels now in regular Topps Chrome. And if you look at Topps Chrome Ben Baller, Topps Chrome Cosmic, Topps Chrome Sonic, Topps, not Cosmic, that one's not the same image. Ben Baller, uh, Sonic, um, a couple of other Logo Fractor. I think there's five total set that all share the same image of the same player. And there's 59 parallels in all of those combined of the same rookie image. So I said, and I don't mean like Topps Chrome is dead. Obviously, people are still going to collect it. The important cards are going to be valuable. But I said it's dead in the sense that the brand that we all loved is gone. There's now 20 different sets with the name Topps Chrome in them when there used to be one all the way up until 2016. And there was two with Sapphire, and there wasn't more till later. So what's your thoughts on Topps Chrome? Is that too critical? Or do you agree that we've kind of hit a tipping point where Topps is just milking this for all they can get? I'll open this up to anybody, whoever wants to go first. I, I don't want to put anybody on the spot if you don't have any, you know, real thoughts on it. I've talked a lot on Mark Moore's channel about the number of parallels in products and how these things are kind of coming. And I, I dropped a note on our chat yesterday that I was surprised to see that Platinum Anniversary Edition, what was it, 37 parallels or something like Tops has just kind of followed suit. Like Panini, I think, was really setting the pace with some of the expansion of the number of parallels. And then when you talk about having multiple other products like related to Tops Chrome that have additional parallels, it just gets very confusing. On the one hand, it makes it so that somebody can get a cool looking card potentially, you know, because there's so many of them. It's, it's you know, I, I don't particularly like to collect. I mentioned this on a video recently. I don't like to collect like base chromium cards typically um, some years really to me don't look good at all. Uh, others, the more, the, the newer printing technology, they tend to look fine. Um, but you know, I like shiny. So when you start introducing a lot of shiny and different, you know, variations, it, it drives the cost down, I think on a number of um, players makes them maybe more affordable, but it also creates a lot of confusion for collectors and anybody who's trying to look for the right card to invest in long-term. And in that sense, I think you were right, Scott, like it's kind of killed the the long-term investability of certain cards and now people are left wondering well, what is you know how do i compare apples to apples from one year to the next or from five years ago to this year when i'm looking at a gold refractor rookie card to 50 um we discussed that you know the the variations in the print runs over the years like number to 99 number to 50 number to 25 number to whatever overall i'd just like to see more consistency and i don't at the end of the day you know Fanatics, Tops, these companies are running businesses and we can all pontificate all we want on our Instagram stories and other things, you know, with our wish list of ways that we wish they would respect the collector more, but they're not going to. They're they're a business. They're going to try to make money and keep printing cards. And in that regard, I don't know what the better solution is. I, I forget the exact specifics. So I, I ran an Instagram poll like maybe three weeks ago asking like, what would the solution be if if there is higher demand, if the, if the company needs to accommodate higher demand, what's the solution? And is it to create, you know, more different products and have, you know, fewer flagship print runs? Is it to create more variations? Is it to create image variations with parallels of them? Or is it just to create more base cards and have it harder to hit hits? And I was, it was like 60% said, just create more base cards and make it harder to get hits. But I feel like we saw that last year. Uh, was it, was it series one? What was the product that was absolutely brutal from tops with like 
where it completely shifted within the last year where you couldn't hit anything. Well, Topps Chrome update from 2022 <laughs> is really tough. It was, it was one of the flagship. It was one of the paper products. It too, was top changed. series one with the actual retail products just being horrendous <laughs> and jumbo boxes were low. Yeah. That's yeah. what it was. Yeah. So they, sh they shifted everything around, right? Yeah. That, that's exactly what it was. So, um, I don't know that there's a perfect solution. So that's where my mind kind of went to. I, I was really surprised when you, I think you had that graphic up in your video about like just all the different parallels for like a particular rookie. You see them all across the different, you know, sets too. And it's problematic. I don't know what it means long-term for the cards that are being printed today and how the hobby is going to respect things um, when there's so many different variations. So that's kind of. So two thoughts. I actually want to say a little bit about the feedback I received from individuals who they, people were really upset at some people were about this. I wasn't trying to like attack their favorite thing, but the one thing I said is, well, the hobby's bigger now than it's ever been. So it's okay. I'm like, yeah, it's big right now, but give it 10 years when it's not big anymore. And we're confused about certain players back in like Albert Pujols. I used him as an example. He has a retrofractor and a gold retrofractor. That's it. People are confused by that. Like there's two parallels of his tops Chrome card. Basically one is not really tops Chrome. It's a foil. That's why it's confusing. But it's going to be hard, especially if somehow the hobby does shrink. If FanX doesn't 10 exit, then it's going to be hard. But even if they do 10 exit, uh, a lot of the people they're introducing just want the profit. They don't care about the card, and that's fine. We need that type of people to open the boxes for us. Uh, but like they want to open it, sell their cards, you know, flip it for profit. And that's cool. But long term, it's just there's going to be, I imagine a bigger spread of the important parallels and the not important parallels. And it's going to be interesting to see how that evolves. But Chris, Phil, what are your thoughts on this? I'll go with you first, Phil. Oh, Chris, Chris, you're about to talk. I'm sorry. I was actually uh, burping on mute. No, um, <laughs> I, I, I'll take the opposite end and say, if the demand is actually, if, if I don't know if Fanatics is selling this much stuff, but if they're selling enough that they need 27 parallels, then it's very alive. Like if the demand is up, but you just have to kind of, what we're talking about, you have to sort of look at the future and say, if a parallel is brand new this year, it's probably not going to be as in demand, you know, 10 years from now. I think, uh, when did Topps Golds go to 50? Was it like 2008, 2007? It was something like that, right? I think it was, it was later than that. Yeah, I think it was like 2009. Let me look. Okay, let's look that up real quick. It's Yeah, it's something right around there. I know 2009 and 10 are to 50, but I thought there was one more year. So, I mean, that card... The more the parallels expand, the more the rainbow expands, the gold out of 50, as long as let's just hope, hope like hell that they don't change that. Like that needs to stay the same. And as long as that stays the same, that card will always be in demand. And it's just getting harder and harder to find. I have no interest in a lava. I have no interest in a shimmer or a, um, a wave, any of that stuff. But yeah, I mean, I think they have to put stuff in these boxes. They have to number it so people think, They've got something special. And slowly people are going to realize that a lot of this stuff is not as special as they thought. I think that's hitting right now, Chris. That yeah. realization is hitting newer individuals in the hobby. Probably. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's cool that they they have they have expanded the hobby a little bit. I'm fine with all these other parallels because I'm not breaking any of this stuff anyway. So it doesn't really, it just makes me have to wait longer for the colors that I want to show up on eBay. That's really my personal, how I am personally affected by the expanded rainbow counter question um to your i want to like challenge you a little bit uh because i want to hear your thoughts because you might have something i haven't thought of yet but what about like actual long-term value we're seeing some otani cards like the short prints and super short prints that should have value and they have value relative to other cards but if there was only one short print of otani's flagship image if there's only one super short print they would be worth exponentially more yeah. So does that not concern you that we're diluting everything so much to the point where it's, conf one, confusing? Right now, I feel like we kind of know what we want to collect as an overall hobby. That's going to change. Like So one, like is that not a concern to you at all? Yes, it is absolutely a concern that we are diluting this. But I think it will, the main things will maintain value. Like the Topps Chrome Gold, the Topps Chrome Orange, the Topps Chrome Red. I think those three are going to be fine. But like you said, with image variations, we are just, we. Fanatics is beating that into the ground. Like I use Michael Harris as an example. He's got a top series one golden mirror, a tops update golden mirror, a Bowman Chrome rookie image variation, a tops Chrome image variation, and a tops Chrome update image variation. Those are just the first five that, that came to mind. 
I know we had to get on a checklist for stadium club variation. We may never see that. But, I mean, it, Corbin Carroll has even more because he has an SSP out of Topps Chrome. So, yeah, I would say all – unfortunately, and I hate to say this because I love image variations, but that water is getting muddied to the point where it's going to be impossible to know what these cards are five years from now. Gold, they're also – I'm sorry, complete set image variations as well, so add that one. Like – God, I mean, God help if PSA starts messing up some of these slabs, some of these flips too, and mislabels something, no one's ever going to know what any of these image variations are. So I've almost, for 2023, I have not bought a single uh, raw card yet. And if I do, it'll just be a Michael Harris, like Topps Chrome Gold. But even that does concern me because of all the gold refractors he has. You were going through the list, but you even forgot like the Sapphire. He's got a Topps Chrome Sapphire Gold, and then I think he's going to be in Sapphire Update Gold. And he's got yeah. Bowman, Bowman Sapphire Gold, Bowman Chrome Image, or Bowman Chrome Sapphire Image Variation Gold. I mean, I can't even say that without taking a breath. Like, yes, we are. I think we are getting to the point where all the Chrome brands are going to be diluted. But I still will always want the base Topps Chrome Gold Refractor. I feel like that card will always have value, even though it becomes a needle in a just an infinite haystack. Okay, Phil, what's your thoughts? Yeah, so. I um, of the belief that a lot of what, what Scott's saying is, is from one perspective and somewhat of a narrow perspective, although it is technically one of my perspectives too, and it's the, the investor perspective of a certain player. It's less so the perspective of a wax opener, less so even the perspective of, hey, some collectors might really like to collect different Topps Chrome cards, even if they are the same image. Some collectors go after the entire rainbow, even though that's like <laughs> nearly impossible nowadays. <laughs> Um, even if you have like infinite time and money. Um, I guess I think that what's happened at Topps Chrome over the years is a product of its own success. And I think if you were to look back 10, 20 years, Topps Chrome maybe wasn't intended to be a high-end brand that where the singles values would be preserved over time. And you could argue against that saying like, well, then what was the high-end brand? Well, I'd say that there probably wasn't or weren't many high-end brands at the time. And after like 2005, then I start to point people and even, you know, early in 2000, I start to point people to Bowman Chrome like that. That was intended to be the investable brand. And based on like the hierarchy that collectors and investors use today, product wise, Topps Chrome would fall below Bowman Chrome, uh, depending on who you ask. Right. Can I, can um, I challenge you, Phil, on that? Sure. Topps Chrome claims itself as home of the rookie autograph. So obviously they're self-aware that it's an important set to collectors. Yeah, to collectors. There you go. And so, investors. Like it's supposed to be the card. If we talk about collectors and investors, that's a majority of the yeah, hobby. But this was a box that was like uh, up till four years ago. We're talking like $70 to $100 box. Um, I think maybe the direction where they want to go in could be to make this cheaper from a per card perspective. So it's a, it's a set collector product too. So that's one of the things that flagship and heritage have um, that Topps Chrome does not. Price per card, it's too difficult to just like set collect Topps Chrome for a lot of people. You're dealing with four cards per pack versus like nine with heritage, 14 through through series two. So so maybe the direction they're going in is actually completely against what everybody here wants. And it's to let's make this like really accessible. And I wouldn't be surprised. So if you look at Topps Chrome update from this year, they made uh, they made a concerted effort to include some inserts in some short printed inserts. And maybe that's another way they can get away from printing 40 flavors of the same card. Um, or, and I kind of like what they've done with having 10 sets, 10 to 12 sets with Topps Chrome in the name. Some will share the image, some will not. It allows them to then not overprint Topps Chrome. But at the end of the day, we've talked about this before. Their number one customer, they're concerned with the primary market. It's the breakers, it's the people opening it. And they've got to make this product attractive to them. And if they're to really limit in like tighten, I'm going to say tighten the, 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 the base cards, the print run on the base cards, because that's what would ultimately happen if you're to take away the parallels, right? If they're to do that, then you're looking at like $400 hobby box. And that's not going to make anybody happy. This is supposed to be an accessible product. Um, and this is one. If you look at the last couple of years, you can bash them for like the pricing of the product because 21 Topps Chrome has fallen after release and so has 22. 22, we know that was like a one-off situation where they really messed up. They missed the extended short prints and out came the nightmare kind of 
situation where they had to do the silver pack program. 21 tops grown was interesting because by, by the time they printed that, that was literally the peak of the ultra modern boom in 2021. And all the rookies faded from that product. So that makes sense why that one went down because demand was temporary. Should they have known? Yeah, maybe, but you've got to satisfy the demand you have at that given time, right? And you can't predict one, two years out. You can't always do that. You can't predict cycles. Um, you can't predict the extreme nature of some cycles. And then we've got 23 Tops Chrome comes out this year, and it's almost up 100% since release. So maybe they should have printed more of it. Maybe they should have included more parallels. There's an argument to be made there, too. Um, you're looking at eBay. You're probably not going to find any for under $230 right now. Check. This is a product that came out pre-sale like $130. So. So a couple of things I want to say, right? You mentioned that Topps Chrome did, was, couldn't have been viewed as like the premium product because of the price point of 70, 70 bucks or whatever it was going to be. If we rewind, and this is dramatic, and I know this is dramatic, Phil, so stick with me. But if we rewind to 2003 with Exquisite when that was $500 a box, everybody was losing their mind over that box, how expensive it was. No one wanted to buy it because it was so expensive for $500 a box. But now $500 a box is a box of Crown Royale in basketball, and that product's not viewed as a top important top 20 product. And so it's, that's more of a consequence of the time, but it was still viewed as the high end. So Topps Chrome still could have been viewed as like a premium product, even though the price point was lower. I do feel like, yes, I see what you're saying, but a lot of it for me goes back to breakers. Um, they just have to print enough where their model is going to be breaking model and they have to have enough product. Plus they have to get enough product for individuals and we're going to have to live with it. But for me, and I believe for others, like I'm looking at it from a collector and an investor perspective. I wouldn't say it's too narrow minded because collectors like specific colors and parallels and so do investors. So at the end of the day, you're appeasing to collectors long-term for your cards to have value, but our collector is going to want a purple, sh uh, what purple sonar from 2023 tops Chrome. I don't think so. So just my two cents, but challenge me, Phil, if you disagree still. You know, I think the beauty of this and uh, Chris kind of alluded to it is you can still stick to the true colors if you want to. Yeah, it's going to be hard to get them. And there's still going to be cannibalization likely in the long term, if not today, from gold shimmers, gold waves, golds and competing products. But that's the best that we're going to get, guys. Yeah. And this is just one product. 2003, you didn't have 10 high-end products in our next episode we're going to cover that yeah, that's a good are point. trying to be the high-end. They're trying to market themselves as the higher-end versions. And in addition to that, you've got Bowman Chrome Autographs. You can't forget that, too. So I, I'm okay with the current situation, knowing that there's always going to be trade-offs. Are you going to collect 2023 as much as you would have other years from a long-term perspective, or are you going to stay away from it because of that? Uh, collect. Sure. I'll collect it all day. Um, okay, let's say speculate. Investment it. <laughs> yeah, speculate and invest. Uh, no, okay. no, That's I will problem. not. Yeah. Um, and, um, but at the end of the day is a product really for me. And I would say maybe it's not fair. Do we think that tops Chrome is replacing flagship in a way where now it's more accepted that it's printed to such a high volume that it's more okay. And flagship is just kind of dead more so than Topps Chrome? Or is that just the same thought process where there's printing to demand for now and it's a cyclical thing and it will drop in the future? Anybody can answer that question. I'm hoping it's cyclical. I'll put it that way. Although I, I was shocked I went into a, uh, um, I went into my, my local car shopping, uh, I wanna say it was like February or March, I forget what it was, but I had some, uh, I was using doing the buyback program and I had like five bucks left over and I was like, well, I'll just get like three packs of, uh, of Top Series One. And they were $4 a piece. I, that, that almost like, I, I just, I couldn't wrap my head around that, but anyway, um, yeah, it's the same thing though. They're going to print that to the moon, but I'm only going to want the, the, the black parallel anyway. So as far as I'm concerned, they can print it all they want. It's not going to change what single card I go after. Visually. I like, I do. I personally like the other effects as well. I've always been a fan of all of them. I'm not just a true color purist, but that's from a collector perspective and and i think uh there is something to the you know kind of long-term investability of certain cards and sticking to that lineage of true colors so i'll just say that do you think it'll sorry i don't want to keep asking questions but i'm going to do we think it's going to evolve more and maybe someday golds won't be as sought after i know golds is a terrible gold thing. will be gold, gold for sure will be. let's say blue um, blue is one we talk about as like long-term color 
Like, yeah, I mean, there, there is, there's a question, right? There's a question like, what, what would you, we've done a lot of what, what would you rather is, and I think it's a fun exercise and you look at like a gold wave or a gold lava or a gold, whatever, you know, these things are, and then stack it up against maybe a true color that's, you know, blue or what, you know, something slightly less rare and say, what would you rather have? And what would not necessarily only what would we rather have, but what would the 20 year old rather have, uh, you know, the, 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 the younger generation, the, the 15 year old, what do they think is cooler? Um, a lot of that's what's going to set the tone in the future too. Agree. I agree. I know we're 48 minutes. I just want to say, since we're talking about tops Chrome, the update inserts called uh, celebration. Those cards are awesome. They're sweet. That's some of the best looking stuff that tops Chrome has made in the last couple of years. The Julio Rodriguez is, I think it's his best looking card of the year where he's just holding the trident. Absolutely fantastic. And I love it's tops going to tops. The Otani card, the whole back talks about the samurai helmet that the team wears when they celebrate. And of course, Otani's not wearing it in the picture. It's just spot on tops right there. But yeah, those insert cards are great. I, love I agree. That's like what I like they did about it is they didn't make like another non numbered parallel or insert because they have a lot of those already that are super, super, super rare. I love that the base are numbered to 99. And I hope they keep that numbering forever. And that becomes a thing. And it's like our version of the kaboom, maybe. So we'll see but all right guys well thanks for listening uh if you are listening still 50 49 minutes whatever we're at make sure you like and subscribe it means you enjoy it and you'll see more of our content if you do so and if you are on spotify please leave a five-star review if you enjoyed it and other than that we will catch you in the next episode